All right. So hello, everyone, and welcome again to this FKI Special Interest Group on Computer Vision webinar. Uh, this is the first in the series, and I'm very happy to uh, chair the first session of the webinar today. We will have three uh, talks for you, and our uh, first talk is uh, on Machine Vision uh, Group, 40 Years of Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition Research uh, by my uh, old friend, colleague, and a great scholar that we have had in Finland. We're happy to introduce Professor Matti Pietikainen, uh, celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Machine Vision Group at the University of Oulu. Uh, Matti, I could say a lot of things to introduce you, but you uh, don't need them. Everybody in Finland and abroad knows you quite well, and it's just a pleasure and an honor to have you today uh, giving our uh, the first uh, opening talk in the webinar. So uh, Matti, the floor is yours. Please share your screen and start your presentation. Remind you that we have the presentation as 30 minutes and we will allow questions and answers Answer. after that. So please, so please Matti, go ahead. Go ahead. OK, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, so this is about 40 years of computer vision and pattern recognition research. So first, of course, I wish all good morning and welcome to this, this seminar. So here are five key professors over the years of our group. I will mention their names later in research. So currently, our group is part of Center for Machine Vision and Signal Analysis, major part of it. It's in machine vision, but there are also people from biomedical signal analysis and language analysis and so on. So those who want to see more information from our group can find a link here from where our 25th anniversary book was done 20, 19, 2005 or six, I guess. And then there's also annual reports from 1997 to 2015. So this link work but it's not work so you can find their link to the anniversary book and also this annual report so so it's history from 1970 to 2006 and selected publications and also some some articles written by different people. So our general objective, we aim at fundamental contributions to multimodal emotional interfacing for human-centered computing in the future ultra-densified 6G communications and edge computing infrastructure. This 6G is very hot topic in Oulu currently because there's one, one of these flagships in this area. But our unit's selected strategic focus is on affective computing, learning image, video, and 3D representations, geometric 3D vision, biosignal analysis and embedded vision systems. And our papers during past 15 years or more have been very well cited. Here are from the web, web of science. So we, I guess this statistics was come done last year or so. so we have five papers in top 
20 most cited papers from Finland in engineering category and six in computer science. And this is the group or Center for Machine Vision Research currently. So I established it in 1981 when I returned from my research visit to University of Maryland. So I did there my research for Dr. Tikri in Oulu, dealing with texture analysis and segmentation. So there are three professors, Olli Silven is the head of the unit now. So he was my first master student in nine, late 1981. Tapio Seppanen was later our student and got doctor's degree from our group. Janne Heikkilä is only Silvens first doctor and Guang Zhao got, his, got her PhD from Chinese Academy of Sciences in 2005 and after that she joined our group. And we are happy that Guang got academic professorship. She will start just in one week, this five-year period, and I have some slides at the end about, his, about her project. And we have one associate professor, Murat Osala, and three assistant professors, Li Liu, Piao Bai Li, and Miguel Bordalo Lobes. And I am emeritus professor now. And we have nine senior researchers and postdocs, and 32 doctoral students, and several visiting scholars, especially from China, but also from other countries. And currently about 80% of the research pensions are from abroad. 15 years ago, it was only about 30%. So now, now we are very dependent on international visitors and personnel. And our recent international collaborators include many famous universities like from Chinese Academy of Sciences, Imperial College London, Harvard University, Oxford University, and, and many other universities. And this is statistics about the bibliometric data done by Leiden University, I guess, for 2013-2017. So this PFAL full tells about publications in Web of Science in each year. And PP International Collaboration shows how many of these papers are have authors from different countries. So currently about six, 2017, about 66% of the papers had one foreign author. And I guess this number is how higher today. And PP top 10, so this tells about the proposals of publication that belong to the top 10 most frequently cited in the same field. So we had 0.32 in 2017 and mean over this years is 0.23. So well, well about the average. And this is about our ecosystem impact. First about spin-off research groups and spin-out companies that our group or our, let's say, groups that are, have been formed by, by members of our group. So currently there are about 25 companies in total. And these red ones are those who are founded during the last five years. So our, and our young doctors have, have formed their own research group. So when machine research group came too big, it was natural that it was divided into smaller groups of 
represented in different fields. And this division has been continuing since this slide has been drawn. And very important practical or ecosystem impact is also that many of our graduates and postdocs are now professors in Finland and abroad. Of course, there are quite many from at US Oulu, but also Juho and Visa Koivunen at Aalto University, Tampere University, Esa Rahtu, and Eastern Finland just selected Xinliu as an associate professor. Vaasa has Jani Putelier and VTT as at least Heikki Ailisto who's working in AI, got his PhD from our lab, and some Chinese universities. And now I present examples of MVG's past research. Visual. So my research at Maryland dealt with texture analysis and segmentation, and it ended in, in one, one, 1981 when I returned from our, my 14 month trip to Maryland. And for the same, for, for the 80s, we didn't do much research on text analysis later, but in the 90s, it formed a central part of our basic research. But instead, when I came to Finland, we started to work with metal visual inspection because it was very important application area and it was easier to find funding from techs and industry. And Olli Silven did his PhD on, on Inspection may start after the product is placed on the XY table. The table moves under a line scan camera that captures a 2000 picture element wide image during the movement. The imaging is synchronized to the pulses obtained from the linear position transducer. The high 5 micrometer imaging resolution of the system enables the inspection of printed wiring boards with under 100 micrometer trace width. Dedicated hardware was needed and Dr. Ilka Virtanen and others from our group developed microprogrammable hardware for, for inspection application, but also for other applications. Another important application area was metal strip in, in inspection, finding and recognizing defects from the rolling mills. And our research on mobile robots also started in the 80s, in the about mid 80s. Juha Röning, who is now a professor in our university, did his doctor's degree from mobile robots. And this system used three camera stereo vision system that was based on my research at during my postdoc visit to Maryland in 1984-85. And it had serious calibration problems for three using three cameras. So that was create some basis also for our later research on camera calibration that that Jan Heikkilä and Juho Kannala and others, others have done in our group. And in the 90s, we started our research on color and face image analysis. We were studying illumination variations to skin color and developed methods for, for face detection under varying illumination. And we, we created a physics-based database that has been since then used by different, many different research groups and, and companies abroad. There's Elspieta Marzalek was doctor from Poland doing that research and Birgitta Martinkaup, who is now is at University of Vasa, did her PhD on this. 
topic. And Janne Heikkilä started his PhD on 3D modeling and camera calibration. Janne was a student of Olli Silveen. And then Janne and Olli also did research on tracking and motion estimation. One application estimate was counting pedestrians and bicycles from, from videos online. So this is a real time system. And in document analysis, Jakko Sauvola, who is currently a professor, did his PhD on document analysis. And we had also other doctors in that field and collaboration with University of Maryland, David Derman, who, is, who was one of the leading figures in document analysis. And in visual inspection, wood inspection was a main, major topic because it's very important for the Finnish industry. Oli Silven was a key person in this research. And this is about visualization-based user interfacing using self-organizing map. So it's much easier for the system user to train the system using this kind of visualization of the feature, feature space, different. So the aim is to classify wood to different quality classes and the price of the wood depends on its quality class. So it's an important problem that one Finnish company was using results of this research in their product. And another, we were in European project, but that was different applications, including, including metal inspection, but also food particle inspection, such as rice or coffee beans. So they, they should be online detected and reacted if there are some defects in the in the individual items. And Olli and his students worked with video codex developing error residence video codex for mining machines. So this was also for industrial applications and this result experience and results of this work has been used in many other projects later. And together with VTT Technical Research Center, we had a big techs funded projects dealing with, dealing with paper roll manipulators and automation of paper roll manipulators in harbor environment. So we developed a new control system and it was using also range imaging by laser, copied by laser. So here are some important results from the 80s, from the 90s to 10s. So this geometric camera calibration that was first Janne Heikkilas and Oli Silvens work at CVPR 1997 and later there was a Janne's paper in PAMI also. So this CVR paper has now or had yesterday 2,955 2, citations in Google Scholar. And the toolbox has been used by hundreds or thousands of laboratories around the world. I don't remember the ex exact name. Maybe you all know about it. And then Juho Karnala did his doctoral degree under guidance of Janne Heikkilä. And Sami Brandt was also sometime in our group. They had, a, for example, a geometric camera calibration article in Encyclopedia of Computer Science and Engineering. And you had also, with Sami Brandt, a paper in PAMI about camera calibration. And Daniel Her Herrera did his PhD guided by Juho and Janne. And Topic was 
joint depth and color calibration with distortion correction. So there was Kinect camera providing depth information and color camera information, and calibrating these two cameras was important, is important. And in the 90s, there was metallurgical breakthrough in text. We started this texture analysis research. Again, David Harwood from University of Maryland made a, a few month visit to Oulu. And Timo Oyala was my new master's doctoral student who did his master's thesis earlier, early 90s. And this local binary pattern operator cut his, its basis at that time, which later created much reputation for our group. So this paper has first paper published in pattern recognition earlier version was at ICPR 1994, has nearly 8,000 citations in Google Scholar. So I guess this is the most cited paper of the journal ever. And most of these citations came many years later because this value of the LPP was not seen by the research community until, until we published generalized version a few years later. So important properties that is invariant to any monotonic gravelet change and computationally extreme simple, allowing real-time text analysis. So this next paper that was first published in ECCV 2000, but extended version in PAMI 2002, which had a, was a generalized version of this original LPP. So it allows arbitrary circular neighborhoods, multiple scales, rotation invariance, and so on. So it has now over 16,000 citations in Google Scholar and among most cited these papers of PAMI journal since its publication. And I guess the most cited Finnish paper in ICT area published in 2002. And this LPP was getting very hot at that time and yet another breakthrough was developing method for phase description with LPP. So Timo Ahonen did first his master's thesis in top, did his master's thesis on, topic, on this topic and after having had it was a postdoc in our group. Or this is doctoral research at that time and then this paper and its early version published at ECCV have been very widely cited. So this is now over 6,600 6, cites in Google and ECCV paper over 3,000 sites. So this EV, ECCV paper was awarded the Kunderich Prize 2014 for fundamental contribution in computer vision that withstood the test of time. That means 10 years later, it was still, still widely used and cited. And going so, she did her PhD at the Chinese Academy of Sciences Institute of Computing, in, comp, Institute of Computing and she joined our group as a postdoc just after, after getting her PhD about her paper about dynamic, first paper, journal paper was dynamic texture recognition using local binary patterns with application to facial expression. So this created basis for, for dynamic texture analysis, but also to facial expression analysis using, using video. And this is also very well cited nearly 2,800 citations in Google Scholar. So this is dynamic texture and this LPP top that is main results is spatiotemporal version of the LPP operation. And during the 2010s, one methodological breakthrough was spontaneous micro expressions. So this was first other was, we had a paper in ICCV 2011 
first author was Thomas Fister, who did his civil service in our group at the time, and Yapa Lee. So he, she was a doctoral student, but now she is an assistant professor in our group and going and myself. So this was the first paper to work to do recognition of spontaneous facial microexpressions, not acted major microexpressions that some other works did. So these microexpressions are rapid involuntary facial expressions and they reveal suppressed effect. So when to try to, to suppress your emotions. And here are some potential applications like police interrogation or price negotiation. So the negotiator knows when the, when the customer is, seems to have a good price. So this used, used spatiotemporal LPP and multiple kernel learning among other things. And we also Access. applied LP-based method for detecting 2D space spoofing attacks. Jukka Määttä, who is currently Jukka Komulainen, did his PhD on this topic and Abdel Hadid was with us also. And this paper won IET Biometrics Premium Award and also five year highest impact Access award. Applied. So without counter measures, biometric systems are vulnerable to spoofing at that time. And falsifying biometric face data is easy. So the aim is to try to identify when, when the video or image is true or not. And another example application interaction with social robot. So here we had academy projects and EU local regional funds funds for this. So we developed a robot system using SEAGET robot basis, and then we had different sensors, including kinet cameras and and microphones and video cameras, and then avatar display and visual speech synthesis. This was collaboration with UH Earnings Robotics Group at that time. And here is a demo. Hello. Hi. Are there any news? Yes, there are totally 20 feeds. Give the number you want to hear. 19. Okay, the topic of the news number 19 goes like Saudi Arabia to import Finnish education expertise. Bye. Bye, have a nice day. So it's getting news from the internet. internet. And here we we also developed a method for heart rate measurement from videos. Yeah, by me was the key photo in that paper and going down. And that's the supervisor. And this this video is just from a student recruitment days in, in Oulu, where this scale time system built by Jukka Holappa, showing this girl, was doing real time analysis. And it, it also did gender and emotion, rough emotion recognition. And next, some examples of our current research. So assistant professor, Li Liu is specialized in energy and sample efficient AI. She was earlier that had many papers on local binary patterns, which created basis for that. And I'm collaborating with her frequently. 
So key challenges of deep learning include high energy costs and the tremendous human effort needed in labeling the samples. So why are the biological systems much better than, for example, over 20 million neuron artificial neural network? There are examples like house flies, which have about 150,000 neurons learned from single sweating attempts. And ants have about 400,000 neurons and they build colonies. And it should also be mentioned that human brain dissipates only 20 watts. So that's very extremely low compared what compared what neural networks consume, especially during training, training and, and human brain does many other things, not just solve a single problem. So fundamental new results are needed to enable energy efficient representation of learning with less data and labels. So this technology is vital, for example, for mobile or wearable devices smart glasses, smart sensors embedded in the environment and Li Liu and others have written several papers in top forms in this on this area. And one related highly cited paper is recent survey on generic object detection, which has now already 900 citations since its RXY version was published just a little over two years ago. So this will be very highly cited paper in coming years. And we have also, Li Liu and I have been involved in several, several, organizing several workshops in connection of top conferences on this research area and also special issues. So currently there's in PAMI a special issue on learning with less labels for Lilio is the first, first guest editor. I am one of the others. And here's Guing's research dealing with human, robust human emotion interp interpretation in general settings. So here is about micro expressions, macro expressions that are ordinary expressions and then micro expressions. So this is example of research on group emotion analysis. So analyze emotion of different people in the same video. And this video is about detecting micro expressions from, from video. So there are, you can see light boxes where you have either micro expressions or eye blinks, which are very, rapid compared to the ordinary facial expressions. This is about Janne Heikkilas and his students' work. So this is 3D to add context recognition by 3D use synthesis from smartphone video. So here is casually captured video on the left and then there are novel views on the right. And I took one example of Jannes and his students' other works, and also Juho Kannala and Simo Serke from Aalto are included there, and Jiri Matas from Czech Technical University, who, who was the FIDI pro professor in our group, and, and in Tampere University with Joni Kemera and, and Janne Mustoniemi was doctoral student of Janne Heikkilä. So here is one paper I chose here is gyroscope aided motion deploring with deep net network. So it incorporates gyroscope measurements into a CNN and handles strong and spatial reversal motion. So it overcomes the lim limitations of gyro-based plural estimation and cut received state of our personal. So the left is blurry image, then is deep gyro information, and then details. On the right, you can see that uh, the, there are much more details in the video. This is about medical image and signal analysis 
this is about video-based biosignal extraction. On the left, you can see video-based heart rate measurement. And there is also video-based res respiration rate measurements that are important signals, signals in biomedical image analysis or video analysis. And right, right is video about using thermal camera for detecting vital signs from persons. This is Miguel Bordello Lobes, who is one of our new assistant professor. And about this biosignal analysis, yeah, Tapio, Professor Tapio Seppanen has worked since 1990s or even earlier with medical doctors in different problems of biosignal analysis. This is about cardiovascular brain pulse, pulsations. They are changing in Alzheimer's disease. So this was done with Professor, Professor Kivini, Vesa Kivinimi from our university. And then, then it's Rajna, first author is Tapio Seppanen's PhD students. I don't know much about the, but about this paper, but anyway, the cardiovascular pulsations drive the brain's cleaning system. So propagation of pulse refrain is measured as 3D optical foam. So this is very important application area because the speed and direction are changing in Alzheimer's disease. And this is about Oli Silves and his students' work dealing with flat imaging for embedded perceptual user interfaces. So you can, you can we have been developing te technology for, for this kind of research. So you could have an array of sensors to measure, measure properties, for example, attached on the wall. And then a few words about going South, South Academy professor project. So background, so this is emotion AI. As background, there are various facial expressions and body gestures expertise in everyday communications. But do these also two emotions? And I guess not. So there are five various facial expressions and body gestures expert, expert in everyday communication. And this is active smile, not a real smile. And this is micro expression anguish that human eye cannot see. So the, this is about project plan. So it's based on passive imaging suitable for long periods and no discomfort. And you use masks for privacy protection. So it's important that you don't you cannot recognize whom you are whom you are measuring. So there is privacy protection for facial information. And it's also using heartbeats and speeding information here in this. So the, you have spontaneous facial ex ordinary facial expressions or post or acted facial expressions then you have micro expressions but there are also micro gestures very rapid gestures that humans do without knowing that they they do like this it's just picking taking his nose and then remote physical signals like heart rate and respiration rate. There were examples earlier. So this is about impact, plant impact, novel methods in affective video processing and understanding. And this affects many fields of science, including computer science, social behavior, psychology, and 
open needs, open access and data sharing, and you know, application emotional well-being, e-teaching, home care, and security. And this is last slide. I guess this slide was done 10 years ago or earlier. I always even maybe remembers better. But it reflects what we have done, done much during past 10 years or so. So we are, and also currently, so we have been focusing on human-centered ubiquitous systems that are omnipresent, invisible, and imminent. So we predicted that technical wireless infrastructure will be everywhere in man-made environment from wallpaper to vehicles to clothes and blood flow. And you need sensing, imaging, communication, intelligence, and energy efficiency. And machine vision will be a key role by sensing and understanding human actions, face detection, recognition, lip reading, gesture recognition, and interpreting emotions. And we have been studying all these during the past few years. So kind of model for this research was how 9,000 computer in, in Dr. Clark, Clark's and Stanley Kubitik's space Odyssey book and film later. So that was the end of presentation. Maybe I a little bit exceeded the time, but do you have questions? Okay, uh, thank you, Matti, very much for the great presentation. Uh, 40 years of machine vision research at the University of Oulu, led by Matti Pietikainen and the great scholars, the professors, postdocs, and researchers in the team. Um, one thing we noticed that uh, many of the problems that Matti exposed in this review have in computer vision, they have not changed. They are still problems dealt with today, maybe with different methods and different performances, but they are the same type of problems, uh, showing a vision of the group and the vision of the leaders of the group at that time, that these are the concrete uh, problems to be solved in this field. And um, the impact of the machine vision group and their publications, worldwide uh, is so clear from the citations from the uh, use in uh, industry uh, products uh, in Finland and abroad, and also the great internationalization activities and the collaboration that we have seen in uh, Oulu University. So thank you so much for uh, this overview. And it brought up a lot of uh, memories for uh, many of the people who are uh, attending the webinar today and uh, uh, myself as well since I started I joined uh, Tampere University uh, 30 years ago so I still remember uh, around two uh, two thirds or three quarter of what Matti was talking about so great great to have you great to have the presentation and happy 40th anniversary to the machine vision group in Oulu and we wish you a great success and great continuation, uh, especially with uh, Guying Zhao's uh, new Academy of Finland professorship. We are very, very happy uh, to receive that news. So congratulations, Guying, and we Thank wish you. you all the best. So um, we have, uh, we can still take a few uh, questions. If there are some questions, just remember to uh, unmute yourself if you have a question for Matti. And remember that you can also use the chat to uh, write a comment or a question. So any, any comments or questions to Matti? Juha, yes, go ahead, Juha. Um, uh, well, I would like to ask that, what do you, Matti, think about the future of the field do you have some expectations or predictions since you have so long perspective to the uh, to the history of the, of the field so of course the computer vision is and will be everywhere of course currently maybe too much of the research is focusing on deep learning i think i think because deep learning has its problems and cannot solve all problems so we should find computationally 
light methods that can be easily and that doesn't need so much training data yeah. like like humans they can learn only from a few samples so we need new methods for machine learning learning and of course also for other parts of computer computer vision to make real problems and go more to general ai where where you don't need to solve every problem separately but you can you can build complex systems more easily easily and use same technologies as part of them so i guess there is still a long way to go and as the number of participants in top conferences now 10,000 or something like that so it shows that the, there's currently lots of industrial interest also in this area yeah. that was not the case in 20 40 years ago yes. only. Th thank you Mati, but, for... but of, course, of course this basic research funding is i guess what has been discussed that's a key problem so it's now everything for every funding in finland seems to be in that should not be industry related so it's very difficult to get 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 funding for longer going was lucky to get academy professor for, yes. for other others this competition for funding is too high and so on and this group group like us it takes to develop tens even tens of years to make to make it world recognized so so it's very important that this basic research gets support enough to survive so uh, i'm worried about this funding situation currently in finland yes the 40 million uh, euro cut from academy of finland budget or 15 yeah, million yeah. does yeah. not sound encouraging and and the, and the case the role of the case has changed in the 90s it, it, it has these kind of projects led by university and industry needed to pay only part of the costs so this were i guess without those projects many companies spin out companies would not have would not exist that's correct thank you um any other comments or questions anything in the chat Okay, if not, uh, I would like to thank Matti for the great presentation uh, and the great overview and congratulations on the great work and the impact worldwide about this research and my uh, uh, greatest wishes for continued success to the group, uh, to all of you. So thank you very much and uh, Juho, uh, Kannala will take it from here. Introduce our next speaker. So you okay? Thank on. you for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Matti and Monche. Uh, is our next speaker Serkan um, hearing? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. So I, I will introduce you and we can start. Okay, so uh, I have the honor to introduce our next speaker, who is Professor Serkan Kiranas from Qatar University. Professor Kiranas has received his bachelor's and master's degrees from Pilkent University and his doctoral degree from Tampere University of Technology, where he has also worked as a professor. He has strong expertise in various areas of signal processing. He has published two books and numerous scientific articles and served as a principal investigator in several national and international projects. His principal research field is machine learning and signal processing, where he is aiming for reinventing the ways in novel signal processing paradigms and enriching it with new approaches, especially in machine intelligence. Uh, Professor Kiranas has made significant contributions on biosignal analysis, particularly EEG and ECG analysis and processing, classification and segmentation, 
and computer vision with applications in various areas. The title of his today's talk is New Generation Neural Networks and Applications, about which we will now learn more. So welcome, Serkan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Juho. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, actually, let me start with the uh, last comment Matti has made. Um, I fully agree with him. And uh, that's actually what I'm going to talk about today, um, new generation neural networks and applications. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to give you a, only a glimpse of what we are doing. And if you want to hear more about this story, uh, please attend the ISIC tutorial. Uh, just in a few weeks, uh, we will make a tutorial uh, in ISIC. And this is now a short version of three hours uh, tutorial. So without further ado, uh, this is my outline. And I'd like to give my outline over the, uh, over the time evolution of artificial uh, neural networks. Uh, I will start by talking briefly about uh, generalized operational perceptrons, uh, the GOPs, and uh, I will then talk about uh, operational neural networks with operational neurons, and then I will introduce the concept of uh, self-organized uh, ONNs with uh, generative neurons, and then uh, finally the, uh, our latest uh, neural model, the super neurons, and what we are aiming to accomplish with this model on, uh, on new generation uh, self-organized ONNs or cell phones in short. On the left side, you are seeing the uh, original timeline of the uh, conventional neural networks. Uh, the story started with McClough Pitts model, 1943. And now we are 2021, and from perceptrons to multilayer perceptrons and then convolutional neurons. And, uh, and of course, the CNNs that uh, we are enjoying today in many deep learning applications. Uh, you will see that uh, our motivation actually comes from this uh, conventional line. Uh, because uh, what we see, they, they have some issues, like uh, they only have a linear neural model. What they do is a linear weighted sum. It turns to convolution in CNNs, of course. So since every neuron is the same, I mean, can only do one operation, uh, these are homogeneous networks. Uh, well, all neurons can perform uh, linear transformation. And their kernels are localized. Therefore, uh, they have a limited receptive field size. For instance, if you are using a three by three kernel uh, in a CNN, and you can get information from only nine pixels from the previous layer neurons. I mean, in short, I can say that uh, all these conventional neurons, they do the same thing uh, uh, for the like linear convolution at the same place and all the time. <clears throat> So this is what we want to change, uh, and we want to alter it where the, we relax uh, doing the same thing. And uh, we also want to relax this localized kernels. And definitely we want to relax the hom homogeneity of the, uh, uh, of the uh, neural network structure. What I can say that uh, deep networks, uh, they have to go deep. Uh, because of this uh, drastic issues about their learning capacity. Uh, and then ultimately, if you can do the right thing, the right operation, not necessarily linear, at the right place with this non-localized kernels and the right time for any connection, you will end up with a heterogeneous network. And that network can yield much higher learning capacity than what we have uh, currently. So let me start with the doing the uh, right thing. This is our motto. We say that the human intelligence is heterogeneous and uh, non-linear, so should AI be. So let's see if we can do that. And I'll just show you a very brief uh, model of biological neural network. Uh, you all know that in biological neural network, uh, we have the synaptic connections. Uh, this is the uh, model of the uh, biological neuron. And then the, uh, the terminal buttons, the, this uh, cell connects to other neurons from the terminal buttons to the dentaries of other neurons, and they make a network. And on these terminal buttons, uh, this is the uh, synapses actually called, and the, the, in the synaptic gap, we have these neurotransmitters. And the neurochemistry of these neurotransmitters changes when the learning occurs. And, uh, and chemistry here can be modeled and there are many models now, and very different types of synapses. And the 
fact is that uh, there is no actually linear transformation going on here. So in neurological systems, there are several distinct operations with uh, proper chemistry are created to accomplish a, a massive diversity. And they are of course trained in uh, regular time to learn many neural functions. Um, these neural networks, both biological and artificial, with higher diversity of computational operators, we have more computational powers. And uh, we have a fact, as a neuroscientific fact, that uh, adding more neural diversity allows the neural si network size and the total connections to be reduced. So you can learn more with much more compact uh, networks in general if you have this diversity. Uh, but contrary to these uh, neuroscientific facts, we have this ancient uh, neuron model, I mean, which makes linear transformation only from 1950s. And this is, has been ever been used uh, in any uh, conventional uh, feed forward uh, artificial neural network, especially in multi-layer perceptron and the CNS. And uh, of course, as I told you earlier, it can only perform a linear transformation with localized kernels and which makes MLPs and CNS entirely homogeneous with the static neural model in terms of uh, transformation and uh, localization, which is very contrary to the, to the facts of the uh, biological neurons. So the, our model has started in 2014, 2015 by changing uh, the conventional multilayer perceptron structure. On the left-hand side, you see the, uh, the MLP, which makes this uh, linear weighted sum, the linear transformation, to create the inputs. Uh, and then, of course, maybe the only nonlinearity you have is the activation operator, and you get the output. And nowadays, we are using ReLU, and there is nothing nonlinear on ReLU, even so it's a linear uh, transformation too. What we did is we relaxed this uh, linear transformation part. We put any uh, synaptic or we call it nodal operator. And this now function is not necessarily linear. I mean, in general, at least non-linear. But we have a library of choosing this nodal operator. And the pooling operator, the summation here is not necessarily only summation. It can be any pooling operator. For instance, you can use median or correlation or any other. Uh, pooling operator, which you know generates one number from n many numbers, and then of course we have activation operators. It's, it's a, I mean, existing biological neural model in the axon, so we like to keep it here. And finally, we get the outputs generated. So now it's up to you which synaptic uh, operator you would like to use as the psi here, as the pooling operator and the activation operator, and then you can generate. Uh, uh, the output uh, according to. And then of course, since you are changing the operation and the transformation, you will have a he totally heterogeneous network, which gives you immense uh, diversity. So this is what we have, what we are doing. Of course, the question is, since you need to know which uh, operator set, the PSI, the P and the F you should be using, you need to search for them. Providing that you do your search properly and you find the right operator set for every neuron in your network, then I can tell you that the GOPs, the generalized operation perceptrons, can perform, um, I mean, much better than the uh, conventional MLPs. I mean, here, much better, it doesn't mean that like 10%, 20%. For instance, if you want to regress this function, this is a Rastrigin function in 2D, uh, with a uh, reasonable size, let's say two, three hidden layers, MLP with, I don't know, with a few hundred of neurons, you cannot. I mean, if you try, you will see a very large error. It's almost 0% regression accuracy. Or if you want to learn uh, this two CPRS problem, I mean, there are journal papers only about this problem. MLP cannot learn it unless you go really deep. I mean, then of course, if you have more neurons than the number of uh, data points here, yes, you learn. But I mean, what is the point then? Actually, we didn't stay in this two spell problem. We extended by 30 times. And I can tell you that uh, with GOPS, you can learn these kind of problems, these challenging problems, uh, 100%. So here, I'm not talking about like 5%, 10% improvements, 0% to 100%. So that's the contrast between uh, the learning ability and only using less than uh, 10, 20 neurons. That's all you need. They can learn better in a much compact uh, model, 
uh, than the, their linear and homogeneous uh, counterparts. Actually, it's not fair to compare GOPs with MLPs. Perhaps we should, I, should, I can show you a more, uh, let's say, straight uh, comparison against the uh, AMPs, these extreme learning machines. So we compare GOPs against uh, the very latest uh, AMPs. And the green part here, you see, is what we are getting in many problems. Uh, and we are beating AMPs consistently almost all problems that we encounter. So if you are interested with more about this dense uh, feed forwards, uh, fully connected networks, I, I put some uh, references here, to, welcome to read. But all in all, just doing the right thing, making the right transformation gives you a great power in terms of learning. That's, that's the message that I wanted to give first. Now let me talk about a little bit of operational neural networks. Uh, so. First, it was operational perceptrons, which was a dense network. Now we're going to move it to uh, operational neural networks, but the idea is the same. So look at the con conventional CNN here on the left side uh, with two restrictions, basically. You can turn an MLP to a CNN. Yeah, you know that, I mean, there are two restrictions. It's like uh, limited connectivity. So when you have three by three kernels, uh, one pixel here is connected to only nine pixels in the previous layer. So this is the limited connectivity and weight sharing. Whatever you use, the weights that for this connection, you share it for all connections, all pixels, to create this uh, input map on the next layer. So weight sharing and limited connectivity, if you add it on top of MLP, you end up with a, a convolutional neuron of uh, CN. Uh, so they actually bear the same issues, same drawbacks and limitations. I and mean, their learning uh, capacity is very limited unless they go deep. I mean, that's actually what I see is, this is one of the reasons they need to go deep to get this, uh, I mean, to break this uh, insufficient learning capability and also to improve their uh, receptive field size. We're gonna talk about this later. But so what we did is we did, we apply the same two restrictions over box and we turn it to an ONN. So again, we have the uh, limited connectivity and the weight sharing. Of course, these are not weights anymore. These are the parameters of the nodal operators, basically. And then uh, same thing, same idea. The nodal operators are here, the pool operator is here, and the activation operator. And again, you need to search. This is the uh, overhead, but providing that you search well and you find right operator sets for your neurons in your, in your network, then you improve quite well. So I think, how can I show you, uh, we improve the learning capability like in the Bob's case. And what I have done is uh, I, we made very uh, limited training. We use only 10% of the data for training. We attacked very harsh problems, but we will be seeing one or two examples I can put. They are the harshest problems. For example, if I show you denoising, you will see that the noise level is very, very high. Resolution is low. Training is very limited. And networks are very compact. I'm making this, this severe so that we can really compare the, uh, the performance of uh, two models. Right? So that's, that's, that's the reason. OK. Now, I don't think that uh, you can understand with this noise level the content of the images here. Uh, there, this is the uh, salt and pepper noise with 40% of uh, probability. And uh, of course, these are the, from the training results. And with the uh, three hidden layer convolutional neural network, sufficiently complex uh, with, I think, uh, around 100 neurons, you can get the uh, denoising this well. This is how much you can get with an uh, one. Again, we find that. Uh, uh, nodal and pool operators, and we can really improve uh, the results, and that's the target image. Again, this is from CNN, and what we get, ONN, and the target image. I mean, as the results show, uh, the learning performance is quite high. Everything is the same. We apply the same number of iterations, back propagation, uh, without any tricks. No other tricks like dropouts, bash normalization, whatever. Uh, these are one-to-one -one results. And uh, even though you get much more complex CNNs, four times more complex CNNs, 
uh, they cannot even come even closer. Actually, you can't go too deep. As I told you, uh, the training set was very limited. So this is the challenge of learning from the least uh, to do the job. And of course, more interesting is from the test results, but you will see the same performance gap on the test results too, if you compare uh, any two images here. But they learn and they generalize much better than their counterparts. Again, more result, uh, references about ONNs, but you don't need to memorize these. Uh, simply um, visit our webpage, cellphone.net. <coughs> yeah. Everything here is, uh, I mean, given there. Uh, also the resources and the codes and everything. OK, now <clears throat> I'm going to talk about now a recent variant of ONNs. We call it self-organized ONNs uh, and uh, with generative neurons. So the neuron model is now a bit different. Once again, we want to do the right thing at the right place and the right time. And yes, ONNs do the right transformation, but uh, what if the right transformation is not in your library? I mean, you need to start with the library and you are searching for the right operator set, but what if you don't have it at, uh, to start with? And then, uh, of course, we cannot do normalized search. It's too expensive. We are making layer by search, and this gives us a limited heterogeneity because you're going to use the same uh, operator set or few operator sets per layer. And that's, uh, we don't like, it's uh, quite a limited heterogeneity, limited diversity, because you are bound to the uh, set of operators in the library and you cannot customize your operators. I mean, if you're gonna use a Gaussian or a sinusoid a harmonic, it has to be a perfect sinusoid, a perfect Gaussian. What if you need a distorted sinusoid? You cannot alter the sinusoid. The only thing you can alter is the frequency of the sinusoid. If it is a Gaussian, you can change the variance of the Gaussian. I mean, the fatness of the gas. If it's exponential, you can change the power factor of the exponential. But it got to be exponential. So what if you need some changes to make it even better? You can't, it's static. And of course, on top of that, they are complex. Why you are using nonlinear operators? Uh, it, they take time, more time than linear transformation, of course. Plus, computational demanding, because you have to search for them first. So this. Uh, overhead is sometimes the killer. I mean, nobody wants to search. So now instead, we change this to a new model. And again, to explain you very briefly, once again, on the left is the CNN, where three by three kernel can only do the linear transformation. So everything is a line here with the slope is changing. And this is what we are looking for in CNN. The weights basically are uh, optimizing. In an ONN in the middle, yes, we can assign now any nonlinear uh, operator or transformation, let's say sinusoid, and you can now change the frequency, you can get uh, any proper, let's say for every kernel element. Uh, but again, everything got to be a sinusoid and you cannot change them and et cetera, et cetera. We have issues with that and you need to search for what operator set to be assigned, of course. And now with the new model, we don't search anything. We don't have a library base. So there is almost no overhead. What we do is we create the nonlinear function uh, during training. And uh, to do that, uh, we use the approximation, like Taylor approximation. You know that the uh, Taylor or McDonald's series, they can approximate any nonlinear function uh, quite well uh, near, near some point. And if you do it, for example, near zero, and if you use tangent hyperbolic as your activation operator, well, uh, basically, you can generate any function that you will be willing. And the nice thing about this generation is since it is during the optimization process, you end up with the optimal nonlinear transformation that you will be needing to do what? To do the uh, learning process. So that's the idea. And again, if you look at that, uh, we can generate any arbitrary uh, transformation. It can be even linear, by the way, or it can be even sinusoid, if this is the, you know, the best needed uh, transformation. But any arbitrary, as opposed to a fixed nodal operator in the ONS. And I don't need to tell you that the diversity level that you can get here, the heterogeneity and diversity level is, you know, is, is, is maximum. Because even not for kernel, for kernel, each kernel element, you, can, you are ending up with a different uh, transformation. 
and that's actually the main thing. And then I can't show you right now, but uh, a cell phone basically can turn out to be a series of convolutions with the powers of the previous layer uh, feature maps. These are the powers, second power, third power, the cute power. And at the end of the day, you are just making convolutions with these powers and adding them up. That is equivalent to the Taylor approximation that uh, you, you need to approximate that nonlinear operator. So computationally, it's also uh, quite uh, nice because this time uh, there is nothing. Uh, I mean, you can optimize this with, with, with the GPU or CUDA uh, with the proper programming. And that's what we are doing, actually. The only thing you need to do extra part is the taking the powers and the rest are convolutions and you do know that the convolutions are uh, greatly optimized and these are actually can be parallelized. So uh, it will not take more time than a single convolution at least, as providing that you have the uh, GPU power for this of course. So uh, we have a project with Huawei last year and uh, what, this is what we are observing. We got a portable state of the arts. Uh, we have same computation complexity, much better performance on vice versa. Uh, with a much compact network, we are getting uh, better, uh, uh, same recovery performance with the state of the art and much sharper. Since we are using nonlinear operators, again, I'm going to show you a few examples only from uh, denoising. You will notice the difference. So, once again, uh, we apply. Uh, quite high level of noise. And we also use some benchmark uh, data sets for that. And again, uh, CNN versus the uh, cell phones and having the same parameters. Having the same parameters, by the way, since we are using much larger number of parameters in general with the same neuron, uh, the results that you will be seeing here has several times, three to 10 times less neurons than the uh, the CNN. So what we are equalizing is the number of parameters in between them. Yeah, so let's start with real world denoising. And we are comparing with DN CNN. Uh, this is a deep network with 17 layers. And you can see the number of parameters. We have the equivalent network, same number of layers, half of the layers, less than half actually, and quarter of the layers. And of course, number of neurons also diminished in the same time. This is the order of the Taylor approximation, and you can see the number of uh, parameters here. The NCNN was the state of the art in 2018 and 2019, and uh, that's a good you know, comparison for us and, uh, to start with. And again, we have the two, three different data sets and the noise input with the PSNR level. This is what you can get with the NCNN. And as long as you actually equalize the, uh, the network configuration, you can see up to 2 dB improvements, 1 to 2 dB improvements uh, in terms of PSNR and 3-4% uh, improvement on the SSIM, which is extremely significant. But my point is, even if you use the half or even quarter, uh, many times you can beat uh, the NCNN using quarter of the uh, layers and much less number of parameters and nodes. So that's the idea, and we are, this is what we are hoping to get. Um, and also, uh, we compare with other uh, networks over here. So we got the best PSNR compared with other uh, networks here. BM3D is not a network, but you, I think you know, all know BM3D as the denoiser uh, from 2010, and others potential networks and again we are getting i mean let's say even with four layers we are getting very comp competitive results with the uh, state-of-the-art denoising networks just to give you an idea so these are the results the clean image the noisy the clean the ncnn and uh, we have the cell phone results last two and uh, you can see a much cleaner uh, recovery on the especially on the edges and not only edges, again, uh, you will notice a noisy background uh, where the noise has been suppressed much well from the, uh, with the cell phone results. Uh, this is the paper that we are uh, reporting on ICIP 2021. What we did is we make only a two layer ONN and we compare it with BM3D, which is an old but still used 
uh, methods, famous method from uh, TUT, Tampa University. Um, yeah, even with two layers, uh, we can get, when the noise level is low, we are getting similar results. But the moment the noise level is getting higher, we can get more than one dB on top of BM3D. So the, uh, you, I'm always we are getting the better results and the gap is really exceeding uh, more than a dB. You can actually see some visual examples. So the clean image, the noisy image, clean image, the BM3D and our outputs. So if you compare uh, the edges especially, is much sharper and the texture part is much more cleaner than the uh, blurred version in what you observe in BM3D, which is not a big surprise because at the end of the day, uh, BM3D does averaging, a larger array averaging, but averaging nevertheless, so you end up with blurring inevitably. Okay, so I think I still have time, okay. Um, let me talk about a little bit of what we are doing right now and the, and the future. Uh, what we are aiming is now uh, the improved version, we call it super generative neurons or super neurons in short of this uh, network neuron model and also the network model. And yes, we hope to do the right thing, right transformation. And now we turn our focus on the right place and the right time. We still have some issues. Yes, ONNs do the right transformation, but the issue was what if the, that is not inside your operator set library, so you're gonna be missing it, that's, that's a threat. Cell phones can cook the right transformation, can optimize it, yes, but unfortunately cell phone uh, kernel is always localized. Uh, so it's a localized kernel location for any connection. So what we are aiming now, doing it at the right kernel operation, at the right connection. So we're gonna search for the right position for this kernel. And for that, we're gonna using non-localized kernel operations. What do I mean by that is, let's see this uh, example. To create this pixel, if you have three by three kernel, you are actually using uh, nine pixels in the previous layer output maps, right? Well, if it is three by three, basically you, you are missing all neighboring pixels around. You have to use this nine pixels, nothing but this nine pixels, it's localized. And the different colors means the different uh, neurons in the previous layer or different channels in the previous layer. Uh, but again, to create this, you are using the same location uh, and gathering information from the same location. That's why your receptor field size is very limited. Right? You cannot use from the larger uh, array. That's what we want to change. So uh, our objective is using now uh, non-localized kernels uh, and then to improve the receptive field size. We, got, we are not gonna change the kernel sizes. I mean, it's gonna be still three by three, but uh, even using with this uh, kernels, we will enable a superior information flow. So how are we gonna do that? We're gonna now let kernels move to any location nearby, of course, but any, any place that can gather the information the best in an optimal way. What you can do, you can actually randomly uh, localize them. Uh, and then you focus on uh, optimizing the nodal operation for this new location. So we remember that we can really find out the best transformation uh, and then now kernel is in different location, but we can optimize the transformation. So that's still optimized. Or we can optimize both. We can optimize the location as well as uh, the transformation in the same time. So doing the right thing at the right place. You can think it as a optimizing of a, a time function like f of t. This is what we everybody is doing the CNNs, ONNs, everybody. Now we don't do that. We're gonna be optimizing either the shifted version of f of t minus tau, while tau is randomized or fixed, or we can optimize both f and tau simultaneously. So we're gonna shift and find the function for that particular location in a simultaneous way during, uh, let's say training, during back propagation training. So just to show you, this is one, uh, difference, you can, uh, let's say, 
randomly distribute them. And for every kernel location, you just uh, cook the uh, nodal operator. Or, uh, yeah, so this is the, with the random, let's say, localization. Or you optimize both. In this case, the kernel operators, as well as the location, is optimized uh, simultaneously. OK. Again, I'm going to show you a few results only uh, on some uh, selected uh, problems. Again, if you want to see more results, please uh, check our web page. <coughs> and we apply the same um, constraints uh, on top of the, uh, just to see the difference between the two models. Um, several severe restrictions and harsh conditions. And we can really test the learning capability of the, of the different models at the same time. So the first results are from the image transformation. Imagine that a very compact network has to learn uh, to transform one set of images in the input layer to another distinct, different set of images in the output layer. This is just transformation, right? And one network has to learn transform uh, four images from the input to another four in the output. Uh, and the images are not, of course, as you see here, they are not related. They are face images, but from different faces. And in this particular example, there is actually an immerse problem. So from Lena to Monsef, input and output, and then the opposite is here, the Monsef to Lena is here and same here. So it makes it really uh, a challenging one. And now, uh, this is one of the, by the way, hardest problems we ever uh, tested. Uh, and because uh, the network has to learn complete transformation, pixel by pixel, transforming one set of images to another. And even if you use a CNN with two times more neurons, that's the PSNN level you can get on the average. This is the cell phone with the generative neurons we can get like 5 dB improvement, like incredible difference. But now if you use the super generative neurons, you can get another four to five dB improvements. So the difference is now uh, kernel locations are varied, so they are non-localized. And you can see the effect of this in here. So it's a, a drastic change. And now we have like nine dB more difference than even a more complex uh, CNN. And these are some uh, visual results. So the last two, what we get it with the uh, super neurons are very close to the, actually, uh, the, the target image, uh, close to PSNR levels to uh, 30 dB. And with the CNNs, usually, uh, no matter how complex, four times, eight times more neurons in the CNNs and more layers, Results are usually this rubbish. Uh, with the linear transformation only, uh, it turns out that this, uh, this is, becomes a very difficult problem for uh, convolutional neural networks. And what about the blurring? Uh, we apply two types of blurring, the average blurring versus motion blurring. And again, as you noticed, we're going to be making blurring really severe. So that uh, becomes a really challenging problem. Uh, these are some parameters of how we do the blurring, but basically, uh, if, if you blur, we are blurring like 11 by 11 pixels and the averaging. So it makes a really harsh blurring effect. And just show you the PSNR curves. Again, uh, this is the CNN with four times more neurons, the brown on the bottom. And the, with the cell phone with generative neurons, we immediately see 0 0.6, 0 0.7 dB improvement. And with the super neurons, two models, random versus optimized, uh, you can get another one dB difference, even on top of the cell phone results. So then now the gap really widens. And using non-localized kernels actually have an effect uh, much bigger than uh, using the uh, nonlinear operators. So I mean, you are gaining even more uh, in, in this case because of your receptive field size uh, superiority. So that these are the train results and the test results. You can see the same gap again, uh, only widened. Uh, the overall, you have more than one dB deblurring performance level. And again, the input, this is CNN times four deblurring uh, and in generative neurons and the last two again belongs to the super neurons. 
I mean, from this, it can generate an image uh, this well. Once again, 10% training, I mean, very harsh conditions. I mean, this has not changed. I don't, I don't need to repeat. Only 10% 10 uh, training and very compact networks, networks less than 25 nodes. I would say only CNN here has uh, around 100 nodes. Same results you can see in the motion blurring. This time the blurring uh, model is changed. It's a motion blurring now, but uh, once again, you see the same, let's say, layouts. The CNN times four cell phone and cell phone with super nodes. And the results again with motion blurring, uh, input image, and everything here. And actually, uh, the results here is much, we, we, slightly better than what we observe with the average blur. So it adapts much better actually on the motion blurring because you know your kernels are moving, so this is not uh, surprising. So they can actually sense where to go and generate the best results. And uh, some denoising results, uh, average, uh, this is the uh, additive white Gaussian noise denoising results. Uh, again, we are using a, a cell phone and with only three hidden layers. BM3D is here, and these are also cell phones with three hidden layers and CNN with three hidden layers, but more neurons as usual. And the NCNN, the deep version is here, and again, uh, with different uh, data sets, Consistently, we are getting much better results. A big gap now over the BM 3D, even with the uh, noise level is low. And of course, the gap is increasing sometimes below 2 dB, uh, crazy uh, difference over BM 3D. And what is more surprising is we are also beating uh, the deep, deep network. I mean, this guy has 17 layers. We are beating it with uh, three hidden layers only. So that is the difference now. And you can learn much better than a deep network uh, using a compact network. Um, that's actually perhaps what Matti wanted to uh, emphasize at the end. Uh, if you do the right model, uh, you will see the effects. And, and now we will be, uh, if you go deep with this model, God knows how much difference you will get. I mean, that's what, what we're going to try next. So this is very recent results that I'm showing you. Again, some visual results, uh, the super neurons, uh, previous cell phones with generative neurons and the uh, uh, CNN and the CNN and the uh, noisy image. Once again, uh, you are getting pretty good results comparing the harsh noise level that you have on the, on the uh, input image. Even the background is much better. I mean, from this mass to get this smooth background is actually uh, quite interesting. And compared with the CNN and uh, other previous model results, and even more. <clears throat> and uh, again, I mean, the background and the, uh, the edges, the quality in the edges, much sharper and much cleaner. And even a bit of, uh, you, you can get the texture information. Um, if you consider the amount of noise level is quite impressive. Uh, yeah. And these are again denoising, but this time real world denoising results. These are not additive white Gaussian noise. And since it is not additive white Gaussian noise, the gap further increases, especially over the NCNN uh, with only three layers. Uh, now we have like 1.2 dB on top of the NCNN. I mean, not similar results anymore, but even better results with three layers only, once again. Why? Because the NCNN is optimized for additive white Gaussian noise. So when it becomes real world denoising examples, it's not edited. And the noise is not independent from the uh, image. So these are much more realistic, let's say, noise cases. And of course, results uh, further improved by, by, by cell phones with super noise. We would have still a few minutes so that we can take some I'm questions. I'm almost there, yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Again, some, uh, this time, color images, uh, the noisy image, this is what you get from DNCN and, and uh, the cell phone is super on. And uh, again, we will see the similar uh, results, but this time even better uh, on the edges. Uh, you can see that uh, it's a bit complicated and uh, still uh, degraded. And uh, this is now much better with the uh, 
cell phones. All right. So again, uh, please visit our webpage to see more stuff and the codes, everything actually we are sharing them right now. And uh, uh, my final point is, I mean, yes, when you do the right thing in the right place and the right time, you indeed enjoy much better learning performance overall. Uh, we have like dozens more results from uh, several other problems and uh, uh, and surprising, I mean, surprisingly well, uh, even with two, three hidden layers only. So we didn't find time to go deeper because we don't have to until now. Uh, we are really competing with uh, several deep learners. I have classification results, for example, against mobile net. And we can get almost the same results with the five layer cell phone and the mobile net is, I think, 53 layers. Results like that. So uh, that's all for the moment. Sorry that I need to skip many details to come to this level, but I hope I can give you a glimpse of uh, what we are working uh, with a group in Tampere University with uh, Professor Mosef Kabush. And uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Serkan. Um, <clears throat> so we have time for questions, so you can just unmute your microphone and speak up or use the chat or, or raise the hand uh, in, in Zoom. I think Olli has a question, so can you <coughs> unmute your microphone and ask? Yeah, uh, if you aim at uh, equivalent uh, SNRs, uh, how much you actually gain in the computational complexity in comparison to the CNN-based, uh, deep CNN-based solutions? Um, if you equalize the PSNR, your question is how much we can gain from the computational, uh, yeah. computational right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's problem dependent. There are problems where a linear model, linear homogeneous model fits pretty well. Like actually additive white Gaussian noise denoising is one of them. I mean, you, you know that in DSP, yeah. we have filters which is optimized for this kind of noise. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. There, yeah, we, we, we should really, we are gaining again a lot by let's say three to four times less parameters and several times less layers and neurons. Yeah, the uh, number of parameters is not, uh, uh, as you have, uh, have these operational networks, uh, uh, yes. the amount of computations is higher per neural, per connection. However, and that is why, because you did not present these uh, equivalent uh, uh, SNR results, I'm interested in how much it uh, actually costs to achieve uh, an equivalent SNR in, in computations. All right, uh, the only slide I could manage to put it here is this slide. Yeah. So uh, these two, let's say models with four layers only, you can see the number of flops, 28 and 47, and you can compare with the DNCN, which is like 68. So this is in terms of uh, number of flops. Yeah. And the, on the other side, this is the inference time, running time, uh, let's say we are half or le less than half, one third almost level, especially these two layers and eight layer is still less than that. Yeah. And we are beating it even with uh, less complex networks. We couldn't equalize them because this is beyond our hands. We cannot really make a perfect PSNR equivalency. But what I observe usually, we are getting better results with less complexity most of the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Juho, perhaps one uh, comment quickly here, if I may. Yes. Um, so thanks, Serkan, for the nice uh, presentation again. My pleasure. And, um, mm -hmm. I, I think the, what what you guys are seeing today is sort of a paradigm shift in uh, in learning uh, with artificial neural network. Um, if this vision works, um, this will open up. Uh, CNN and replace CNN paradigms with ONN and self-organized ONN in the future. And what we have done uh, in the team with Serkan is just sort of scr scratching the surface. We're just unveiling uh, uh, the power of uh, self-ONN and uh, the applications that Serkan shared with you. Uh, are so deep, but they are just, again, scratching the surface. I recall, and, and many of you, uh, only Matti, recall in the early 90s, 
when we were publishing papers on denoising. If somebody achieves a 0.2 dB gain, uh, they make a big noise and they make a very, very nice paper. And now we are uh, looking at uh, 0.6 and 1 dB and sometimes even more than one and a half dB on this particular type of applications. What we have uh, touched uh, uh, on much less in this research are uh, applications in computer vision. And this is the reason we invited Serkan uh, to make the presentation here so that uh, we, we believe that there will be a huge amount of applications and great performance gains in the field of computer vision. Um, and this is kind of an open invitation to all of you to exploit that. There is a lot of resources in uh, self uh, web webpage with papers uh, and even implementations of many of the things that we have done in the past few years. So uh, open invitation to for, for all of you to start these uh, new paradigms in, um, in, in uh, deep learning and hopefully leading to more compact networks that can do better than uh, CNN and CNN-like networks. One last remark, if I may quickly, is uh, um, to remind uh, people here that um, a cell phone N uh, has, and an ONN also, has a, um, a, uh, a specific uh, sub-optimal or a specific, uh, it's, a, it's a super set of the CNN, meaning that when in this, even in this Taylor series expansion, when the factor Q is equal to one, then we reduce basically to a CNN. So if a CNN is the optimal network for that particular problem, you will end up with a CNN. And this is very, very important. So this is just a superset of these CNNs. It gives you the possibility to expand and have a better learning capability at the neuron level. And you may end up with, or you will end up with a better performance and a more uh, compact network in terms of computational complexity and uh, memory footprint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your interesting talking. And I ha have a question about what's, what's the difference between the deformable convolution and the, uh, your proposed OMN? And uh, another question is, how about it a relationship between the uh, dynamic convolution and uh, your OMN. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a nice question. In deformable convolutions, uh, they deform the kernel, and every element of kernel it can move to some other location. So it's not by let's say square three by three. This can move here. This can move there. So you are kind of deforming it. I mean, as the name implies, and you are doing this layer wise. So we are searching for a, a better place for uh, kernel elements, let's say, per layer. Uh, this is much different than what we are doing here. First of all, we are not deforming it. As you see, the kernel uh, integrity or the, is intact, the same kernel part. And it's not layer-wise. We are doing for every, not even every neuron. For every neuron and every connection of that neuron, we are shuffling the location of the kernels. Not necessarily is they are localized anymore. They can be any uh, nearby position, and for that position, of course, we are cooking a, a particular uh, operator, a particular transformation for that particular position. Or, as I show you uh, on the next one, we can simultaneously optimize both. So during the learning, uh, they move and find out the best possible place for every neuron for every connection without deforming it. The problem that I see on deformable uh, CNNs, yes, I mean, they can, element-wise, they can move out. But then when they move out, then the, the, the I mean, layer-wise, and you are doing it for every neurons in, in, in one layer, uh, what about the original locations? Then you are not getting information from the same part anymore. So you are gaining in one hand, but you are losing on the other. In this case, I mean, when you use, let's say, 32 or 64 neurons, you will be gaining 
you will be sucking information from almost everywhere within your receptive field sets. So you are not missing anything. And plus, of course, since you are doing this neuron-wise, you have a huge diversity. So if you think of this way, uh, that is completely different. And, uh, and I think this is much more beneficial than uh, deformable CNN. And, and actually the results show that the gain that you can get by, by this scenario, especially by this scenario, is usually much higher, much, much higher than any other mode. Uh, yeah, th thank you for your response. And uh, if, if uh, come, uh, in terms of the uh, receptive field, I think maybe using the uh, non-local uh, paragram, uh, such as, uh, for example, the uh, self-attention transformer layer, I think in that case, uh, their, uh, their global uh, receptive field uh, might benefit uh, more, I think, in that way. Uh, so what's your opinion? I mean, there are, this is a good uh, idea, actually. Uh, we have also a few ideas to try on, on top of that. Uh, and uh, as, as I told you, this is quite new, uh, Zitong. So um, I mean, we hope to gather attention. We cannot try everything ourselves. I and mean, we have limited number of uh, researchers. And uh, yeah, ideas like that, we will try in the future and uh, further move it, uh, I mean, in the right direction. One thing I'm also planning in the future is I'm not happy with this three by three, uh, let's say, uh, integer grid of the kernels. The kernels are not scaling here. I mean, you can think the kernels like an eye, they are looking towards the information source, right? And our eye moves. And kernels are moving here too, yes. And we have uh, nonlinear transformation in our biological system, and they do now the same, yes. But our eye also scale. Well, here they are not scaling. So we are planning, for instance, to put sc scalability on the kernels so they can scale up or scale down whatever the best. And we would like to learn this scaling. I mean, there is an FDN paper. They were scaling up by a factor of two. I'm not talking about this naive uh, ad hoc uh, ideas. I'm talking about, can we also learn, optimize for every kernel here, every moved kernel here to proper scale up or down, not only up necessarily, also down. Let's say go, go down to half pixel or quarter pixel level or any arbitrary scale up. I mean like 0 0.352, for instance. So can we do learn and optimize each and every kernel scale up or down? So this is still missing. What you are saying is still missing and many other ideas uh, we will be trying in the near future. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I think it is time to move to the next talk. So um, Professor Koying Sao will take uh, the lead from now on. Thank you very much, Sir Ken, for the very nice uh, presentation. Thank you, you all. Uh, now we move to the next talk for today's webinar, uh, and it's from uh, Mr. Abba Abasha. Uh, Abba, are you here, ready? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, could you please start sharing your screen? So good. Yes, uh, and Abba, currently is a doctoral student uh, in computer science under the supervision of Professor Yanni Odilier in University of Vasa since January this year. He has been working for an uh, Academy of Finland funded project robust and efficient perception for autonomous things. And his research topic is 3D reconstruction and scene completion. He's also a project researcher for a digital economy research platform with University of Vasa. Okay, Abba, please start. Okay, thank you. So for, thank you uh, to present, uh, give me the opportunity to present my work and to also welcome everybody uh, to my presentation. One light cell, lightweight sign agnostic learning for implicit surface representation. This is a joint work with Universal Team and uh, NTNU Norway. 
this presentation I will cover uh, like application of 3D modeling, classical 3D representation and newly emerged one method, like uh, uh, the one we use like uh, neural networks to represent the uh, 3D data. It's also known as implicit representation. Then one related work that we used in our work uh, method, uh, we'll also give a task about that, like a level set. And then one of the uh, approach that used this implicit representation for uh, human shape reconstruction, we'll explain a little bit about that and the limitation of that. And on top of that, we build our own uh, model and then we'll go through the detail of our model in this presentation. So 3D modeling has numerous applications in different fields, like augmented reality, virtual reality, even in the medical field for 3D reconstruction of heart uh, from the extremes you can see, and also in offshore pipeline, pipeline monitoring. Most interestingly also for the human body scanning for cloth size, you can see uh, our work is mainly based on this, like a human shape reconstruction. And also it can, can be extended for the scene completions. So for the 3D, uh, like a classical 3D representation, as you know, like a voxel is uh, the first one that uh, directly uh, is the direct extension of the 2D images, uh, which is in the 3D voxels, uh, we know. This is a 3D disc discretization of 3D space into a, a grid. And it's uh, very easy to process with the neural network. However, it has one problem like a, like it's uh, the, if we increase the resolution, then the memory also increased by like a cubic order. Uh, the second candidate for this 3D representation is like a point cloud and it's a, uh, it's a sparse 3D representation of the uh, 3D space. And uh, the one important, uh, like a, one of the major problem of this is limited number of points can be generated. Although nowadays it's like a million parameter we can yeah, generate, you, using the scanning devices. However, uh, still it's limited for the, uh, like a, uh, uh, the expected uh, resolution we need. And another problem is it uh, does not model connectivity or topology. So we take uh, uh, the third representation in the classical uh, 3D data representation is meshes. It uh, consists of vertices and spaces. However, the number of uh, vertices are limited in this. Uh, uh, representation. That's why we need something new in, uh, uh, for the 3D data, data repre representation. However, uh, also it has one uh, uh, another problem, like it has this uh, self-intersection or discontinuity in the meshes. So uh, that's why like recently there is a new method emerged, like implicit representation. Uh, in this representation using, uh, we uh, train a deep learning model to uh, learn from the these previous representations like uh, from voxels or uh, point cloud. And then uh, in the inference space, uh, we uh, this uh, train model can uh, infer this whole uh, representation as a, like a continuous surface. Uh, uh, this continuous surface, continuous means is this surface can be uh, zoomed arbitrarily. That means these, uh, uh, we can, uh, zoomed it like uh, infinite, infinitely, uh, that will be like a, something like that without any pixelation problem. This one has a low memory footprint and it's not restricted to any specific class. Uh, so we'll, we actually use in our work this uh, implicit representation. So the, before we go for the, uh, our own work, so we use this level set idea in our work so level set is defined as a real valued function of n number of real variables, which can be expressed using these equations. So uh, here uh, in the second part of this equation, this function f of uh, x1 dot dot xn equal to c, this equation, the c is a constant, which uh, by c, we can name this level set. Like if c content a five, then it's a five level set. If c is a zero, then it's a uh, uh, zero level set. And another property of this equation is that if this uh, equation has uh, two uh, variable, then it's known as a level curve or a contour or isoline sometimes. And if it uh, uh, has a three variable, then it's a level surface. So in this case also, in if this equation is expressed as an implicit equation or implicit function, then 
this level surface is also known as an implicit surface. So if we go uh, out of three, then it will be hypersurface. So this idea can be expressed using this uh, picked, uh, graphical interpretation. Uh, and also this idea like this, uh, this, uh, this line, like this uh, uh, blue, black line, this bold black line uh, is if, if it is the zero level set, then if we go outside, then it will be uh, negative. And if we, if, if we go inside, then it's a positive, but it also can be expressed in vice versa. So this whole idea can be expressed using this uh, binary image. So if we transform this binary image into a distance uh, matrix, then it will be like this. So we consider one of the recent approaches that use this implicit representation because it does not require occupancy values or sign distance values. In this uh, field, like uh, computing this occupancy or sign distance is highly computational which we wanted to avoid in our work. And then uh, this method can learn from the raw unoriented data, such as like on cloud or triangle soaps, but the model they use, it's a uh, highly uh, parameter wise, it's a very expensive, like a 4 million, uh, more than 4 million uh, trainable parameter they use to train this model. And also this, uh, uh, this uh, method has a uh, few limitation, like it cannot capture the thin structure and if we set the multi-object, then it does not work. What I mean by multi-object that if you want to train like a two object, like a computer and a chair, then this setting will not work. You have to train this model, each individual uh, object separately. So this two problems. So we actually focus this uh, parameter wise, uh, this trainable parameter we try, uh, uh, we asked in our research, uh, current research that, can we train, uh, can we learn from uh, the raw data directly? Or can we train a model that can uh, be simultaneously compact and expressive? That means we don't want to use that many parameters that uh, this current model they are using. So the compact, uh, here the compact is that we want to use less amount of memory and processing resource. And the expressive means uh, we, we want to uh, like capture the same amount of detail the one they capture in their model. So our model uh, also has the same property like the uh, original baseline cell that it can learn from the raw scans. We don't need to process anything in any processing step we don't have to take. And we de uh, designed this uh, model using a convolutional layer instead of because uh, the original model was uh, designed using a fully connected layer. It's a shared MLP. And then we uh, assume that if this uh, function, like the model we shared and we constructed, uh, if this function can approximate the uh, raw scan or the data, sample data to the uh, zero level, uh, zero level of this, uh, like the, it's a zero level set approximate the X to the surface. So then we assume that yeah, we, 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 for example, like we know that, that data X holds a plane. If there is data that X hold a plane, then it will have maybe one critical weight that it will learn from the training time. And it, this plane can be expressed using a zero level set of this equation, like this function F, which will, uh, the, the surface have an approximate, because we know this surface has an approximate tangent plane nearly everywhere based on this research. So then uh, this proposed light cell that we constructed uh, uh, using one by one convolution instead of uh, like a three by three convolution or even two um, convolution, uh, 2D convolution. This is a 1D convolution with a one by one kernel. Because uh, we chose this, uh, construct, uh, this, this structure because it's a computationally uh, uh, less expensive than the 2D or 3D model. There are some uh, model already uh, proposed using 2D and 3D. They are highly expensive. Like uh, uh, the, the, the baseline cell that we train, the, if we set using their training, then it takes like a more than 100 uh, GPU, uh, uh, GPU memory. But the, the one we designed, it was like a 24 GB memory we can train. And the result is uh, approximately same as the proposed one. So the changes we have made in this uh, light cell is following. So we change all uh, this encoder, it's an encoder and decoder uh, style architecture. So encoder and decoder was designed using fully connected layer, but we replace all of them using one by one convolution layer with one deconvolution. 
So, and the decoder layer we re reduced by from eight layers to six layers, and the we set the uh, we we set the filter in the decoder is in the following manner. Like this red is the original structure, and the blue is our current structure. So by changing this, uh, what we have achieved is like a 70% model size reduction, 50% less training time for the each training epoch, 75% less training epoch for equivalent reconstruction. Means we need 70% less time for the same uh, results we, if you want to achieve. So the graphical illustration of this uh, proposed model, you can see from there and the trainable parameter we have uh, used in our model is, uh, you can see from here. And the original model uh, used this number of parameters. So uh, we set a training environment like, uh, you, uh, so we consider this DFOST or dynamic first data set that one has a 41K data sample of human shapes and it has 10 uh, subject like 10 human who uh, gives like a 14 different poses uh, and we select one out of five data sample that means out of five we select one sample for training and the similar uh, setting is used for the test also uh, we consider this one because we want to compare with the baseline so baseline use the same uh, settings so this data set has this following uh, like a uh, artifacts like a noise holes or coefficient artifact cost by reflection. And the training environment, we uh, set three different condition we put, like uh, our training experiment we did. One is uh, human ship, that means this whole 10 subjects we used for uh, training and testing the uh, model. Then we consider the second is unseen human, that means we remove two of the subject for testing and train with the rest of the eight subject. There, this uh, 10 subject is five is female, five is uh, male. So one female, one uh, uh, male was out for the testing in these settings. And the next is if uh, we remove two poses from the whole data set. And for all these cases, we use one out of five data sample. So typical data, if you see this front view, it's like this. So if you zoom it, this point cloud is like this. It's actually triangle soap. So to compare our results before we go for the, we use this chamfer distance. So we can uh, calculate the chamfer distance using these equations, but uh, we, uh, okay. The, so the training were done. After that, we, uh, 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 these test data we generated, uh, they are exported as a mesh file. And then from that file, we uh, like a sample 30,000 points for the uh, calculating this uh, chamfer distance. So for the first uh, environment like this human shape uh, space learning in these settings, so you, in this setting, we use uh, the whole data set means the 10 subject uh, for uh, this testing and the training. In this setting, uh, these results, you can see uh, these uh, uh, results, it's a, uh, uh, expressed in uh, presented in percentiles. So we use five, uh, five and 50 and 95 percentiles. And this number is multiplied by 100. So the one uh, important thing that we have to, I have to note it has that uh, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, like a general uh, train the model exactly the one propo, uh, like a reported by the original author. They trained that their model like a 2000 epoch. We train our model like a 500 epoch, but when we try to train their model, we couldn't generate the, generate the exact results they provided in their paper because uh, they use this uh, uh, training setting like a number of best size was 64. Because of the GPU memory, we couldn't train it uh, using our resource because we had only 24 GP GPU. So then we use this 12, uh, sorry, 16 as a, a base size and then train it. So we couldn't generate the exact result. That's why we reported all this uh, uh, baseline result from the original paper. So in this setting, only one of the cases, like if by 95 percentile for the, this registration mean the ground truth. So only this setting, we outperform the baseline, but the rest of the result is uh, more or less like a, a very small difference between the our results and the uh, baseline results, but uh, notably we, uh, we should uh, see that they train their model like a 2000 epoch, our model is only 500 epochs, 
and we are getting the almost same results. For the second case, it's uh, uh, like a, uh, we train these unseen human cases. So two subjects were out of the training set and we use this two, two subjects for the testing. So in this case, our uh, uh, results is uh, like a, we outperform in all cases uh, then the baseline. So in this case also, like we report uh, this, uh, their 2000 epoch for the training cases. So they train this model 2000 and we only train this model 500 epoch. In third case, like an unseen pose, the result is same, like we outfer from their model in all cases. Sorry. All cases uh, and also the uh, training was same. Like uh, we only train our model 500 epoch, but their model was trained like a 2000 epoch. So here, uh, one thing is this lower is better. So our results is like this. Okay, so uh, we see the numbers. This is the number. So how is the uh, actual uh, like a qualitative results? So if you see like a for, for the first settings, uh, this is. Uh, it's written like input scan was like this. It has some sort of holes. If you see in the legs and hands, the ground width is like this. For their 2000 uh, epoch train model with a, like a 75% bigger model, uh, their results is uh, the SAL, uh, the baseline model with the 2000 epoch train model results is like this. And our is only 500 epoch with a 75% less uh, parameters. Uh, for the first case, this is the results. So the second is the unseen human shapes where we remove two of the subject out of the training and use this for uh, testing. So this case, uh, this proposed model, we couldn't, uh, they didn't provide this model. So we trained their model for 500 epoch and compare, give these uh, qualitative results. So if you see this, uh, they are missing these hands. So this is one of the issue we found when we train like a, most of the cases there, uh, this model, if we use this 12 base size uh, training with a 500 epoch, then they cannot generalize this uh, test data uh, clearly. And it can, can't reconstruct um, like a, some of the shapes, like a, a parts of the human body, like a hands, sometimes the whole hands is missing. But for our case, uh, our model is uh, giving the detail of the shapes. And clearly you can see these hand shapes and the face and other parts of the body. One, another uh, important thing for this, uh, this model, like this baseline cell that if we train it 500 epoch, the, it, uh, it sometimes generate the exactly same, like a, uh, different shapes than the ground truth. Like uh, it's look like uh, like it, uh, the we 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 ins the input is like a human uh, like uh, for the male subject, but the generated version of this model is somewhat like a female version of the male. So this was one of the another problem of this model. Though the now the third settings, third setting is like an unseen human pose. So in this case, it's uh, more worse than the uh, previous case. So they are missing the hands completely. And also there are some little problem in the legs as well. But for our cases, we, our model can generate the whole uh, hands and with the whole details actually. But then um, does our model generate all the time good results? No, it doesn't. It also have sometimes problem like uh, if you see, it can uh, it can uh, regenerate these uh, hands, but this uh, the it it, it can gener uh, generate the whole hand. So there is a part of the fingers and other things is missing here. So few cases we have this problem as well, but most of the time we generate the exact shape of human body. So then we decided, okay, do we, we design this model? Uh, is there any other model that will perform like a, if we use uh, like a, one big question was we change this fully connected layer to the convolutional layer and we argue that that uh, this fully connected layer, uh, convolutional layer is better than the fully connected layer in this case but then we, we have to we, we decided to train another model that is exactly same as the uh, our proposed model like a light cell 
is uh, so we are replacing all these one by one convolutional layer by fully connected layer in encoder and decoder. Then we said if we increase a little bit uh, about these, uh, if we change the kernel size because we use uh, one by one kernel in our proposed model, and sometimes they also call it like a shared MLP in uh, if we use one by one convolution. Then if if we change it into a three by three kernel, can it generate better result than the proposed one? So for the light cell three by three, it has 10x larger parameter than the proposed one. But for the light cell uh, lean, that means the, this fully connected version of the light cell, it has the exactly same parameter than, uh, the, uh, than the, uh, the, the proposed one, as the proposed one. So then the, we calculate the distance for this, the, this table you see, it's for the second test setting, like the unseen human uh, against the ground truth and the uh, raw scans. So this separate distance, this number, we can see that uh, for the light cell, it has a little bit better in uh, 5% and 95%. Uh, sorry, uh, only this 5%. Uh, our proposed model is performing better in almost uh, every cases, except these two cases. Uh, but uh, this light cell lean that one is uh, like I want to mention um, separately because uh, we 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 are arguing that the convolution layer is better uh, in in this type of model. So then we check this result for this one. So if you see, it's uh, a little bit uh, like our model is outperforming this one in every cases, but. Uh, Notably, that if you see that it also outperformed the baseline cell. So this was one of the finding that we see that uh, from if you, even if you change this light cell into a uh, for using the fully connected layer, then still uh, uh, it cannot uh, perform better than our proposed one. So our decision was in that case was right. So then if we see the qualitative results, so. If you see this, uh, the same problem exists in this cell, like it misses the hands most of the cases, but for the light cell lean, it performs a little bit better than the original cell, but it still have a little problem with the hands in some cases. But light cell three by three or the proposed one, it can, uh, most of the cases, it can generate the complete shape with the detail. So after that, we uh, then in the summaries, uh, so what we did here is we designed a compact uh, model that can reconstruct human or object shape. And uh, this model is 70% less costlier than the baseline or it's a very small in size, like 1 million parameter in total for encoder and decoder. And it requires like a 75% less training time. When you train it, it will be like in 12 hours if you use this uh, RTX 39, uh, 3090 GPU. In 12 hours, you can train this model and it can generate these things. Also like a par epoch training time reduced by 50%. The previous model is like a 75% bigger. So now the, we want to, yeah, the, the baseline model has three problems. So one is uh, it's a uh, little bit bigger in uh, parameter wise. Second was this, it cannot generate the uh, thin, thin structure and also it does not work the uh, uh, multi-object settings. So the, the, we reduce the parameter by a large margin in this uh, research works, but now we are working on this second two problem like a thin structure and uh, uh, multi-object settings. This is our feature research goal. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to our presentation. Now, if you have any question, I'll answer. And also, uh, we put our um, this uh, research work in the archive. If anybody interested, they can read it. Thank you very much, Avo, for the very interesting presentation. Uh, any questions or comments? Please feel free to unmute and speak out. I'll leave your question to chat. Uh, I have a question here um, for Apple. Uh, okay. So has this work submitted to somewhere? Yeah, we, we, we will 
we, 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 we will submit it in these uh, pattern recognition. We didn't submit it yet. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, it's a very nice work. I guess it's now on the review or, or perhaps already published somewhere. So just curious. Uh, and uh, so this is the start of your PhD uh, research. Uh, could you uh, share us your opinions? So what is the big uh, picture uh, of your PhD study? And what are the key challenges you're going to explore during maybe the next three or four years? Well, uh, my PhD is uh, like this compact and expressive model for 3D representation. Like uh, I want to design some model that can be used just in a mobile device. So the parameter wise, I want to reduce the model size as small as possible. And I want to capture as much detail at, as I can, the one that can human can understand actually, actually the detail. So this is the two goal right now I have to for my PhD. And I'm working in this direction. Okay. So the one one big problem, if you the this problem that you mentioned, like uh, one big problem is this models takes a huge amount of GPU memory, which is very difficult for me to learn. Also, the training takes a very long time. Mm -hmm. So these two things I have to always remind uh, in my mind that I, 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 if I want to do something good, then the, the one I did, it's like just the testing that if we want to go in the direction of whether it will work or not. And another thing is uh, like, a, I also trained like a, this, uh, uh, if you train a model, do you need a huge amount of data to train it or not? Like the, I try with a only 16 base size, original training was the, like a 64 base size. For uh, training that model, it takes like uh, five times uh, more GPU than the one I train. So it's uh, this is the thing I'm seeing mm -hmm. this challenging. So I have to go through this. Okay, thank you very much. And it seems there are questions in chat. So Oli, would you like to speak your questions? Yep. Uh, uh, <sighs> All the all the figures, all the pictures, all the silhouettes, or all the point cloud pictures that we saw are for individual persons uh, without uh, without occlusions or multiple persons uh, occluding one another. And uh, I'm interested whether the uh, whether the training times uh, explode. Or how do you plan to uh, train uh, train for situations that uh, involve occlusions? Well, uh, this setting I tried with a single object, but uh, there are some other methods. Like uh, I can say this one of the method is called NDF. It's a neural uh, distance field. So they are already uh, solved this problem. Like if you have an occluded object, like if you have a car and if you see it from the outside and, and, and in the inside is there is chair, uh, chairs, the sitting place. So if you uh, occlude this object, it already can reconstruct. So what I'm uh, like uh, trying to do is like this multi-object setting. So I will add up maybe that method uh, partially and then uh, try to solve it. Uh, thank you. My suspicion is just that, uh, that, uh, that you will need even more computing time <laughs> than you, you have used so far. <laughs> yes, the, the model I mentioned, like this new work, it just published a few days, few months ago. So that one requires more GPU than this one. Of course, you can, uh, you can uh, use simulations to train the network uh, in these cases. Uh, trying to simulate multiple, simul multi multiple cases here. So you, can, you could, in principle, use the data that you already have, but uh, mm -hmm. embed into... Uh, into into uh, synthetic scenes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, I have one question. I'm from uh, uh, Olu University, and uh, my name is Hao Yi Chen. Yeah. Okay. Go on. Yeah, so hi, uh, Abo, I have one question and many concerning about the uh, input of the scan. Uh, so uh, uh, you said you can reconstruct in, uh, the, um, uh, this uh, 3D mesh uh, from the raw scans. So yeah, yeah. But, um, the raw scan has different dimensions. So how do you uh, deal with that? 
Okay, so the dimension uh, for the implicit representation dimension is not a problem. So you can, um, you know, like a, a, if I understood understood your uh, pro, like a pro, a question correctly, like a, did you mean like a, if the, the the this data is in three D or two D or something like that? Uh, yeah, the the things that for example are uh, um, for the. Uh, 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 raw scans, the the let's say the points is uh, the point uh, number of the points is not fixed. So, uh, so oh, okay, okay. do you have anything uh, procedure? So we that? we for this uh, this uh, input scan, the one we used, we only sample like a, a fixed number of points. For our case, we only use two two fifty thousand points for this case. Mm -hmm. So. so uh, you use a downsample method to do that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Just so what uh, about we, the, the uh, uh, regenerated one? So are they uh, 6,801? Uh, no, they, they, in this model, they just uh, export you one, uh, like uh, this latent code. Then from uh, this compressed version, you can expand it to any resolution you want. OK, OK. So here, one big advantage is uh, this representation is you are not bound by any of the resolution. So you can transfer in the, into like a higher resolution if you want, like the, the original scan, if it is 256, but it's actually a point cloud. So if you transfer it into uh, some, some number of points, then you can increase it also if you want. So it, it can be uniform, it can be uh, even non-uniform. Mm, okay. Thank you. So another question is that uh, the usage of this uh, reconstruction. So uh, as far as I know, they already provide you the uh, registration of the 3D mesh. So uh, yes. can you give us some example? Uh, what is the application or say the use case of this kind of a reconstruction? Well, this one I already mentioned, like uh, if you uh, want to buy some clothes in the store and you don't know your size, you mm -hmm. can just use one of these scanner and it will scan your body and says the size. Um, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think uh, this is the last talk of uh, today. Uh, originally scheduled the last talk uh, was from Yago, uh, but the talk is postponed um, because Yago's baby was born recently and he is now on paternity leave. So congratulations to Yago. Um, that's all talks for today. And Monsef, please. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for all of our speakers, uh, Matti, Serkan, and Abol. Uh, for a great start of our webin webinar series. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Guiying Chao for taking the lead in organizing these webinars and for Juho Kannala for helping uh, and coordinating this webinar with us. And um, it's been just a, a pleasure to have these uh, presentations today uh, uh, from Olu kind of uh, giving us the overview of machine learning uh, or, or machine vision uh, and the use of AI and machine learning in computer vision and machine vision. Um, one thing perhaps I would like to uh, conclude this webinar with is to remind our researchers and especially our engineers that uh, although we focus on AI and machine learning uh, tools here for computer vision. Please do not forget what Matti mentioned uh, at, the, at the beginning of the webinar that the, uh, these are uh, but one approach, one computational approach, one type of tools that people use in machine vision and not the only tools and don't certainly don't use machine learning and AI as black boxes in your research work instead learn your problem and use other computational models 
uh, in, uh, in, in your research work and try to understand and combine these different models to enhance your machine uh, learning and AI solutions and make sure that you understand what you're doing rather than just using a black box where your input is the raw data and your output is some fancy uh, representation of what you wanted to do. Um, it, it's been a great pleasure to have so many people today, more than 40 at certain times in the webinar. Uh, as we promised, we are making the video recording of this webinar available in the SIG webpage. I uh, shared the, uh, the URL, the link on chat, so you can copy that. Uh, the, there are two uh, sort of web pages for this SIG here. One is a, uh, a small uh, side web page uh, from FGI, and we have uh, organized our own web page. Uh, Hi, Monsef. Something's wrong on your side. I can't hear you.